Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cancer Screening 101, which is an update on cancer screening. My name is Xavier Yor. I'm an Associate Director for Cancer Screening and Prevention at Yale's Cancer Center and Medical Director of Colorectal Cancer Screening. Um, tonight, we'll discuss updates on uh, breast, cervical, lung, and colorectal cancer with an extraordinary group of panelists that we have with us tonight, and we're lucky to have them. We have uh, Dr. Golden Menderes, uh, Director of Minimal Invasive Gynecological Surgery Program, who is going to give us the update on cervical cancer screening. Uh, Dr. Lin Tenui, Director of the Lung Cancer Screening Program. Um, Dr. Miriam Lasper, Director of the Center for Breast Cancer and Chief of Breast Medical Oncology, and who will talk to us about the updates in breast cancer screening. You can post your questions anytime on the Q&A and we will try to address uh, them either directly in the chat or in the Q&A or at the end of the session. So uh, without further ado, um, here is Dr. Golden Menderes uh, to talk to us about update on cervical cancer screening. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and thanks for having me tonight. It's my pleasure to present the update on cervical cancer screening. Uh, can everyone see my first slide? Not yet. Okay. Let me try this again. Yes. Can we see it now? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're all good. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, the talk tonight is going to be essentially about the epidemiology of uh, cervical cancer followed by risk factors and the significant role of HPV or human papilloma virus in causing uh, cervical cancer, as well as the significant impact of screening guidelines and guidelines based on age and risk group stratification. So uh, in 2020, uh, cervical cancer accounted for an estimated over 600,000 new cases and over 300,000 deaths worldwide. And not, not surprisingly, over 85% of uh, cervical cancer cases, uh, they were from resource limited countries. Cervical cancer was the second most common type of cancer and the third most common cause of cancer mortality. When we look at the continents of Africa and uh, Central America here, we can see the cervical cancer was the leading cause of cancer-related mortality among women. Here we can see in the US, we have over 13,000 new cases with over 4,000 deaths that we see every year. And uh, this is what we do not wanna see as uh, providers. This is a huge mass uh, arising from the cervix here as well as uh, right here, uh, we don't want to see these cases in the in the next couple of decades, hopefully. As far as the risk factors that lead to uh, cervical cancer is concerned, we have behavioral and sexual factors, including large number of sexual partners one might have and early age at first intercourse. Also, smoking has been linked to increase the risk of uh, specifically the squamous kind of cervical cancer, not necessarily the second most common kind, adenocarcinoma. We have history of sexually transmitted diseases and in communities with a diet low in folate, carotene, and vitamin C, we tend to see more numbers. Among other risk factors, again, comes multiparity and early age at first intercourse. These all increase the likelihood of HPV exposure and a lack of routine screening is the one that we're gonna to emphasize tonight. Immunosuppression is another uh, risk factor for developing cervical cancer and infection and exposure to HPV is uh, vital. HPV, uh, it, also known as human papilloma virus is central to the development of cervical neoplasia or precancer, and it can be detected in over 99% of cervical cancers. 80% of the population are exposed to this virus by age 50, and among more than 40 different genital HPV types identified, we have about 15 known to be oncogenic. 
It's a double-stranded DNA virus, and it, it infects the epithelial cells in the skin and mu mucous membranes of vagina and, and cervix. The oncogenic HPV infection of this uh, transformation zone, here we can see the columnar epithelium of the cervix bordering on the squamous epithelium. This is known as transformation zone, is where the HPV virus starts uh, the infection, and then that would lead to precancerous changes and eventually to cancer if there is no screening and no treatments. Here we can see at a more uh, cellular level, the changes that HPV causes, including the coelocytic cells here, the halo around the nuclei of the cells, as well as the binucleation. Our objectives with screening is uh, essentially to prevent morbidity and mortality from cervical cancer, as well as preventing overzealous management of the precursor, precursor lesions that will likely regress or disappear when a patient has a competent immune system. The United States adopted uh, pap smear screening in about uh, 1950s and by mid 1980s, cervical cancer incidence decreased by about 70%. Multiple observational studies continue to sh show the reduction in cervical cancer mortality after uh, systematic follow-up and, and screening guidelines. What do we screen in day-to-day -day life? When we see a patient, we place a speculum uh, in the vagina and our goal is to inspect the entire vaginal mucosa as well as the ectocervix and the endocervix. Here we can see a close-up uh, Im image of the upper vagina, cervicovaginal junction, which is important for cervical cancer screening purposes, the ectocervix, and the endocervix, which is the glandular epithelium. So both the endocervix and the ectocervix is important for practical reasons in terms of screening. In the United States, approximately 50, mil 50 million women undergo a, a pap smear or HPV testing each year. And of these women, about 8% will have an abnormal result. And here, this pyramid shows us the breakdown of uh, pap test abnormalities by frequency. Uh, screening can detect the precursor as well as the early stage uh, for cervical cancer. That way, we can prevent the development of invasive cervical cancer. When a patient is exposed to HPV, uh, the healthy young women would likely uh, get rid of HPV in about six to 12 months. Sometimes when we cannot uh, eliminate the HPV exposure and it persists, we have low-grade cervical precancer changes known as CIN1. In about 24 months, again, a healthy immune system will uh, clear the HPV. If uh, the patient has risk factors as well as not a competent immune system, the low-grade lesions might turn into CIN2 or 3, which is known as high-grade precancer changes. And if there is no intervention, in about 10 to 13 years, the high-grade precancer cells will turn into invasive cervical cancer. So it is not a change from HPV exposure to cancer that occurs overnight, which gives us the opportunity as providers to intervene and eliminate uh, cervical cancers. What happens when a patient has an abnormal screening test? One of many things can happen. The patient might need further testing with HPV. It, the patient might need a repeat cytology colposcopy, or even endometrial biopsy if the cytological abnormality arises from the endocervix, which is the glandular epithelium, which is very much like the endo endometrium, and that would require evaluation as well. Or some patients would be referred to GYN oncologists when there is high-grade precancer changes. The way that we perform colposcopy is in the clinic. There is a, a microscope that is essentially uh, helping the provider to magnify the image in the vagina and the upper cervix. And if need be, uh, colposcopy directed biopsies can be taken for, uh, for bio biopsy purposes. If the patient has any high grade precancer changes, uh, oftentimes we recommend patient to undergo conization, which is simply a cone shaped biopsy of the cervix to eliminate underlying invasive cancers. The way that we perform conization is usually with a cold knife. This kind of illustrates how those procedures are done. 
another way of getting a larger biopsy than just a small cervical biopsy to eliminate underlying uh, cervical cancer is LEAP, which stands for loop electrosurgical excision procedure. This is mostly used by uh, primary OBGYNs and it can easily be performed in the office setting. So um, how do we get patients have cervical cancer in 2022? Uh, it has to be one of many failures that lead to it. Either the patient does not show up for screening or as healthcare providers, we do not offer screening to women when they present for annual exams. The patient might not follow up on abnormal results when there is a colposcopy and a biopsy that shows precancer cells or the patient might not get appropriate treatment to eliminate the precancer cells. And eventually, unfortunately, the patients get cervical cancer, which is our ultimate goal with screening to prevent this. So tonight we're gonna mainly focus on these updated guidelines, which originate from uh, American Cancer Society 2020 update and USPSTF, which stands for United States Preventive Services Tar Task Force which was most recently updated in 2018. For purposes of screening, uh, we should define what an average versus a high risk patient is for developing cervical cancer. An average patient for us would be who is asymptomatic with a competent immune system and who has always had normal screening results in the past. And most of the guidelines focus on average risk patients since this is what we most commonly handle. High-risk patients would be the ones who have immunosuppression for any reason, who has HIV, or who has been exposed to deaths in utero. Deaths used to be a anti-emetic that, that was used in pregnancy until 1970s. So most of these women are now in their 50s, 60s, and uh, it's, not, it's not used anymore, thankfully. So there is one less risk factor uh, these days as far as cervical cancer screening risk, risk stratification is concerned. So the 2018 USPSTF essentially uh, recommends that cervical cancer screening should begin at age 21 and no earlier than 21, regardless of the uh, age of sexual onset. And the main reason for this is uh, the main concern that will be associated with adverse outcomes with follow-up of young reproductive age women when they have minor cytologic abnormalities. Uh, the risk in less than 21 years of age is about 0.1% for cervical cancer. For that reason, uh, most guidelines, including USPSTF, do not recommend uh, starting uh, cervical cancer screening prior to age 21. As far as ages 21 to 29 group is concerned, we have one of two ways of screening these, uh, these young women. USPSTF recommends uh, cytology alone every three years. On the other hand, uh, the most uh, recent 2020 guidelines from American Cancer Society prefers HPV testing alone starting age 20, 25 as opposed to 21 and doing this screening every five years. Uh, the important thing about HPV testing is one, it's not available in all institutions in the US or in many parts of the world. And it, only, uh, it can only be performed with the two FDA approved primary HPV testing uh, methods, including the one from COBAS and OnClarity. So its use is a bit limited at the time, at the time being in the US. There are countries like Australia and Netherlands and UK, which which has these tests readily available and they have been employing HPV testing as their preferred strategy. The rationale for uh, USPSTF recommending age 21 to initiate cervical screening is uh, again, the very low incidence of cervical cancer being 0.1%. And uh, they favor cytology or pap smear over HPV testing because of the higher rates of transient HPV infection. The uh, thought process is that if we do HPV testing in young women, they are more likely to test positive and we are gonna put them through unnecessary colposcopies, cervical biopsies and conization biopsies that would then impair their obstetric outcomes. And these guidelines from USPSTF, uh, they don't account for HPV vaccination rates. 
rate. So that's one of the shortcomings of these guidelines. When we look at American Cancer Society, recommending age of onset for screening 25 is, um, they cite 0.8% cervical cancer uh, rate prior to age 25. And uh, it, it was deemed not to be cost effective to screen women prior to age 25 for that reason. However, they do prefer primary HPV testing due to higher specificity. And the one plus from these guidelines over USPSTF is that they account for HPV vaccination rates. When we look at the age group 30 to 64, 65, this is gonna be a big pool of patients. And we have three options here. We can either do co-testing, which is known as combination of cytology or pap smear plus HPV test. And this can be done every five years and not any more frequent than that. The second option would be primary HPV testing every five years or cytology alone, pap smear alone every three years. So one of these three would be reasonable as far as both of these uh, guidelines are concerned. The USPSTF does not prefer one, or the, one over the other. However, American Cancer Society favors primary HPV testing every five years for women aged 30 to 64. How about uh, women over age 65? Um, essentially, this age group, we will decide to discontinue or continue screening based on the patient's prior results life expectancy and shared decision-making. Uh, if the patients never have had any CIN2 or high-grade cervical precancer lesions, and they have adequate negative screening, which is defined as uh, three consecutive negative PUPs or two consecutive negative primary HPV testing or two consecutive negative co-tests within the last 10 years, this is defined as adequate negative prior screening these uh, women can preferably discontinue cervical cancer screening. In many European countries, um, they do continue until age 75, considering the improved life expectancy in the last couple of decades. And most guidelines do not study this particular question. So I, I do a shared decision-making with the patients when it comes to stopping cervical cancer screening. 65 is not a hard stop. If the patients had a total hysterectomy, meaning their cervix and uterus had been removed and they never have had any high-grade cervical precancer cells, we can stop screening even though the patient might be younger than 65. Most women who need hysterectomies, they do need it for abnormal uterine bleeding, which is something they uh, struggle with prior to age 50. So if we have a patient age 45 who is done with childbearing and underwent a hysterectomy with removal of their cervix and uterus and they never have had any CIN2 or high-grade precancers uh, in the past, that patient can, be, can stop screening for uh, cervical cancer. When is not appropriate to stop at age 65. If a patient has had these high-grade precancer cells, namely CIN2, 3, or adenocarcinoma in situ, then routine screening should continue for an additional 20 years from the last high-grade precancer lesion, and that might well extend beyond age 65. These all, uh, everything we talk so far essentially uh, relates to average risk patients. Uh, when it comes to high-risk patients, we talk about patients with HIV, patients who have been exposed to deaths in utero or have immunosuppression for any reason. For those patients, uh, the guidelines are a little bit more strict and the recommendations are to do cytology or pap smear every three years annually, three years in a row. And if the results are normal, then we can space uh, the screening out to every three years. If we decide to do co-testing, meaning we do a pap smear along with HPV testing at, as the baseline and both cytology and HPV result came back as negative, then we can go ahead and screen these women every three years moving forward. We do not stop at age 65, given the higher risk of HPV persistent and higher risk of high-grade precancer lesions in these women. We continue throughout lifetime. And we do have a lower threshold to do colposcopies and biopsies. 
When we look at uh, future uh, directions, one thing to consider is gonna be the impact of HPV vaccination as the uh, proportion of vaccinated individuals uh, increases, the prevalence of high-risk HPV types is expected to decrease, and that will eventually reduce the positive predictive value for both cytology, pap smear, and primary HPV testing. So we have some ongoing uh, randomized controlled trials to evaluate the performance of primary HPV testing versus cytology in vaccinated HPV vaccinated women. The second thing to consider moving forward in the next decade is going to be probably we will we will see a diminishing role of cytology and uptake in primary HPV testing as uh, the countries such as Australia and Netherlands they, that has the lowest rate of cervical cancer have been employing for over 10 years. The other possible practical solution to improving the uptake in screening is self-sampling. Essentially, patients will start uh, sampling themselves in, 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 a, in any setting and mail these to the providers for evaluation. However, at the time being, this is not an FDA approved uh, strategy. So I am hoping that it will be enabling uh, providers to improve the uptake in screening once uh, FDA uh, approves self-sampling. Summary of guidelines. Uh, Essentially, 2012 was the previous uh, American Cancer Society guidelines before the 2020, and the age of onset for screening then was 21, and age to stop screening was 65 with pop test every three years. As we look at the uh, most recent guidelines, we talked about 2018 USPSTF and 2020 American Cancer Society. There is not much changes to USPSTF guidelines, which says we should start at age 21 and stop screening for cervical cancer at age 65. And for women less than 30 years of age, pap smear is preferred over HPV testing since there is such high prevalence of HPV exposure in the younger patients, and that is most likely to resolve them persist. And over age 30, we can use one of three methods, namely pap test every three years, primary HPV testing every five years, or co-testing that combines the PAP with the HPV every five years. When we look at uh, American Cancer Society, it's a little easier to remember, and I think this is gonna be kind of more prevalent moving forward once we continue to understand the importance of HPV in causing all these precancerous and cancerous changes. And the age to start screening for American Cancer Society is 25. They recommend stopping at age 65 and primary HPV testing every five years is what is preferred. So cervical cancer is one kind of women cancer that we can definitely prevent now that we know that over 99.7% of these cases are caused by the HPV virus. So uh, as we increase the awareness and increase the uptake of screening and HPV vaccination, as GYN oncologists, we hope to eliminate this cancer in the next uh, decade or two. And this is all I have. Uh, I'll see if I have any time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Menderes. Uh, please, uh, to the audience, if you can post any questions at the Q&A tab uh, for Dr. Menderes, that'd be great. And now we're gonna move on to uh, a breast cancer screening uh, with Dr. Lasper. Dr. Lasper, thank you very much for uh, coming to talk to us about this tonight. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I will talk today about practical applications of breast cancer screening with an overview of breast cancer risk factors, how to screen your average risk patient, patients, which will be the majority of your population, as well as screening high risk patients, and then wrapping up quickly with some discussion of modifiable lifestyle risk factors that applies to all risk patients. So um, female sex remains the most, uh, mo mo the highest risk factor for breast cancer, as all of you know, as well as advancing age, family history, and prolonged estrogen exposure, which can be further subdivided into early age of menarche, late age of menopause, late pregnancy, and hormone replacement therapy. 
There are additional risk factors, including exposure to radiation, abnormal breast biopsies, postmenopausal obesity, and uh, excess alcohol use. We will also talk about breast density as a risk factor for breast cancer um, in, in, in the subsequent slide. So that there are multiple models for assessing your patient's risk of breast cancer, and it can sometimes be confusing which one to go with. The Gale model is the most common one, and it's easily searchable, and it, it's relatively easy to do where uh, the risk factors that are included include age, age of first period, age of first live birth, number of first degree relatives with breast cancer, um, and uh, history of breast biopsy, as well as history of pre-malignant changes, such as atypical ductal hyperplasia, does not consider family history beyond first-degree relatives. And this is one of the limitations of this tool. And it does not take into account other cancers or any paternal uh, relatives with cancer in the risk assessment. For this reason, it may not be the most useful in making recommendations for risk reduction, particularly in individuals with hereditary genetic syndromes. But as I said, it's relatively easy to use and very accessible. A more comprehensive tool um, is the Tyra Kuzik or the IBIS model. And this is more extensive, still very easily uh, accessible by a quick search online. And it includes some additional non-genetic uh, risk factors, including height and weight for BMI. Um, it includes some more of family history, as the BRCA1 and 2 mutation, as the risk of invasive breast cancer, DCIS over time, I'm peer risk and a lifetime risk. And it tends to perform best in a high-risk population, but tends to overestimate risk, particularly in those with atypia. The, newer, the newest version, version 8, also takes into account breast density, which I will highlight again why that is important in, in a few slides coming up. Another older model, Klaus, uh, not include um, as many factors as the Tyra Cusick. And it tends to underestimate risk, and for this reason, not as recommended. And it tends to be an older data set, and whether it's applicable to current population, this is, this is one of the concerns about this tool. So if you compare the three models that I've listed here, um, you can see that uh, the, the Klaus model is the most limited, and the Tyra Cusick or the IBIS model takes into account the most factors. So if you're particularly worried about uh, your patient's risk, that is the model that we would recommend. So quick take home points on risk assessment in your busy practice, pick one calculator that you feel comfortable using, know which patients are average risk versus those who are high risk. And those are over 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. I will talk more about the high risk population coming up. And if there's a question on risk or that you're worried that your patient is higher risk, you can absolutely refer them to a high risk genetics program. And for any patient with any type of risk factors, it's also important um, to address modifiable risk factors such as obesity, exercise, and alcohol. So moving on to screening average risk uh, breast patients, um, obviously the point of screening is to identify breast cancers at a much earlier stage so that there is a lower chance of metastasis um, uh, and to have a curable disease. So the guidelines don't always agree on the age to start screening. Um, you can see all the different ages that are listed here with the USPSTF being the most conservative with a start age of 50. Although most recently they have added the clause that patients in their 40s could be screened after informed discussion with their providers. American Cancer Society recommends starting at 45, and the American College of Radiology, as well as a few other societies, including NCCN, recommend starting annually at age 40. I have the NCCN guidelines here for you. As you can see again, if your patient is under the age 40 with average risk, um, the recommendation is for breast awareness, not necessarily breast self-exams, um, and clinical encounters or clinical exams every one to three years. 
and an annual screening mammogram starting at age 40 with a preference for tomosynthesis or, or 3D mammography if available to the patient and in your practice. Patients with increased risk are listed here, and th these include those who have a lifetime risk of greater than or equal to 20%, thoracic radiation, um, those with um, pre-invasive lesions uh, such as LCIS, ADH, um, and a strong family history of genetic factors, even though you may not be able to clearly identify their genetic risk. So uh, for these average risk patients, it's important to, our recommendation is to be, begin mammography at a, a, between the ages of 40 to 45 annually. Which mammogram should you choose? I think the trend is moving toward offering tomosynthesis or 3D mammography to most patients. It has improved resolution, reduced recall rates, um, and it takes a little longer to interpret, but the radiologist really has a much clearer view of what is going on in the breast tissue. A question that often comes up is, is this much higher radiation dose when we use 3D mammography? And the answer is, it's only a very slight increase in whole body uh, back radiation with one 3D mammogram uh, rate increased radiation dose corresponding to about two months of natural annual background radiation. What about increased breast density? So, um, so if your patient is noted in the report to have heterogeneously dense or extremely dense breasts, then in this particular case, absolutely using 3D mammography or tomosynthesis is important. It both increases cancer detection rate and reduces recall. As, as many of you know, um, dense breast tissue can, can be very hard to interpret on mammography and it's also an independent risk factor for breast cancer um, with, with extremely dense breast tissue, increasing the, 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 the future risk of breast cancer fivefold. Um, there is a law in place that uh, in 27 states, including Connecticut, that patients need to be notified of their breast density on their mammography. And as you can see in the pie graph on the bottom, approximately half of your patients will have either heterogeneously dense breasts or extremely dense breasts. And these are the categories in more clear detail for you. The two categories you need to be most concerned about is level three and four, which will be written in the, in the report as heterogeneously dense or extremely dense. And so what is the action plan for your patients with high breast density? I think absolutely incorporating tomosynthesis or, or 3D mammogram in, in their annual imaging for sure. And then discussing the pros and cons of supplemental imaging with an automated whole breast ultrasound. This supplemental imaging um, increases uh, cancer detection rate to about three to four additional cases per 1,000 cases screen. So it's a modest increase and it's important for patients to, to be aware that it's not a huge increase. Um, however, it has some additional drawbacks in addition to some additional costs, depending on insurance. It can be associated with increased recall rates and false positives and increased biopsies particularly in less experienced centers. Therefore, we're, what we're not recommending is that every one of your dense breast tissue patients have a whole breast ultrasound, but it should be a dialogue and shared decision-making. So take home points for average risk, offer a breast imaging starting at age 40 to 45. It has, you have less recall rates with 3D mammograms regardless of your breast density, but surely for those with high breast density, definitely do tomosynthesis and then discuss the pros and cons of supplemental imaging with automated whole breast ultrasound to those with increased breast sensitivity. Moving on to screening high risk patients. These are patients with a strong family history, greater than or equal to 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. And the strongest recommendation is to incorporate breast MRI with contrast. Uh, it's not as useful without contrast as an adjunct to uh, 3D mammography. So typically what we recommend is alternating the breast mammography with MRI. So some type of breast imaging is done every six months. Uh, and obviously the purpose is to identify interval cancers at a much earlier stage. Um, as you can see in the pictures depicted, the MRI 
clearly has a much higher resolution and is able to detect things much more clearly than a mammogram. However, it does need expert breast radiology opinion. It can be expensive. It can be uncomfortable for patients. And it can lead to false positives leading to sometimes unnecessary biopsies. You might ask, well, what if my patient is very high risk? Um, should I also add a third breast imaging modality such as an ultrasound to the mammogram and the MRI? And the answer is clearly no. Based on the EVA trial, the MRI plus mammogram gave the best cancer yield and the addition of an ultrasound to these two modalities as a third imaging procedure did not add anything additional. If for whatever reason your patient cannot tolerate an MRI, you can see uh, that an MRI plus ultrasound can, can also give relatively good yield. So back to the NCCN guidelines for your patients with high risk, it's really important to, to know first who is at risk. So this comes back to good family history, doing using the risk calculators, and then the age of screening is very much dependent on um, uh, who the youngest family member with a positive family history was. And we, we recommend starting 10 years prior to that initial youngest uh, family member diagnosis. Um, and this should, uh, this should not start prior to age 30 for, um, for MRI. Uh, to similar, start 10 years prior to the youngest family members, but not prior to age 25 and consider risk-reducing strategies, um, including medications, which I'll briefly touch on, as well as continuing to emphasize breast awareness so your patients report to you if, you're, if they're noticing changes. There are multiple reasons that a patient can be high risk apart from family history, and that includes thoracic radiation uh, between the ages of 10 and 30 years old. And as you can see, same idea here where imaging typically starts um, eight years after radiation, but not prior to age 30. Uh, and that also applies to breast MRI imaging. These are the genetic alterations that are recognizable to most of you. Uh, and it's the high penetrance and moderate penetrance genes that, are, uh, that have very firm guidelines about earlier and more extensive breast imaging whereas the genes listed on the right-hand column, which have insufficient evidence, we don't have as clear an evidence in terms of um, making screening recommendations. And for, 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 for those category of patients, really the screening is led by family history. And if this can be confusing, certainly a high-risk breast clinic can help you with those decision-making um, junctures. So, but as you can see here, the highest risk genes are listed in the red box and just re-emphasizing the need for alternating mammogram and MRI starting at an early age. And certainly a risk reducing mastectomy can be discussed with this very high risk population with, with the caveat that none of these risk reducing surgeries have impacted overall survival. And so it's really about shared decision-making about many patients can choose to follow the screening guidelines and do not necessarily have to have risk-reducing surgery if that's not their wish. This table here summarizes who should undergo genetic testing, both those with a history of breast cancer, as well as um, those who do not have a personal um, history of breast cancer, but have a strong family history. Uh, I think if you search under NCCN genetic screening guidelines, this would be the best way to, to kind of decide who should be tested. So what do you do when you do find out that your patient is high risk? Certainly it does change their screening recommendations as we talked about. There is an option of risk reducing um, chemo prevention with a number of drugs with tamoxifen being available for premenopausal and postmenopausal women. Um, raloxifen and exemestane and anastrozole also have data in postmenopausal women. Depending on the genetic risk factor and family history, re risk reducing surgeries can also be considered. And we always want to continue to target modifiable risk factors. So, when should you refer a patient to a, to, to a high risk genetics clinic? Really, if you're not sure, if they have very high risk. Uh, 
uh, history such as prior chest wall radiation and known hereditary alteration, a strong family history that's very confusing, or a finding of LCIS, atypical ductal hyperplasia, or other pre-invasive uh, risk lesions. If, if, if the risk model is estimating risk as greater than 20%, we are happy to help. So in your busy practices, I know this can be a lot to take on sometimes, and depending on your comfort level, we're happy to assist. So take home points for high-risk patients, annual mammogram alternating with an annual breast MRI, and there is some evidence that by staggering these two tests, you're essentially offering your patient close observation through imaging every six months. Do not screen women with life expectancy less than 10 years. Um, and generally all our screening data pretty much stops at age 75. However, I think beyond age 75, depending on patient preference and life expectancy, I think individual decisions can be made. I'll wrap up in the next few minutes on lifestyle factors in breast cancer risk reduction. I think we're all aware of multiple sets of data and studies showing that, um, that diet activity levels can be uh, profoundly important for cancer risk reduction, particularly with respect to breast cancer. And the data are actually strongest for physical activity. So as you can see in this plot, our activity level, even in adolescents, um, can, can, can help determine um, our future risk of breast cancer. And uh, so, so any e even patients who are who are not active, inactive in adolescence, but become active later in life, have the option of reducing their future breast cancer risk. So this is something that. I think it's easy to say, it's much harder to implement in our sedentary society, but it's something that, that, that should definitely be discussed for patients. So in terms of next steps, um, obviously, um, I think um, following the guidelines in terms of risk assessment and imaging for sure. And then I think we also need to focus on system level support for weight management, physical activity and diet interventions and particularly the high risk populations and continue to promote um, health education within the community with awareness of the role of obes obesity activity levels and diet breast cancer risk without of course shaming our patients because uh, this is this is these issues are very endemic in, in our culture currently, and it's not any one patient's fault. Um, however, if we can even make some steps toward modifying a few of these factors, it, it can reduce their risk. I'm happy to take questions. I have my cell phone number up on the slide, and I'm happy to get curbside questions. My email is also listed, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lasberg. Uh, and uh, you can go ahead also and um, post your questions to Q&A or as Dr. Lasberg make herself available through her email and uh, cell phone. She's uh, uh, not with us tonight, so she's got some technical difficulties connecting. So we deeply appreciate the fact that you, you made it happen regardless. Thanks a lot. We'll move on then to the uh, uh, lung cancer screening with Dr. Lynn Tanui. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanui. Okay, thanks uh, everybody for being here to listen to these talks. I've actually learned a huge amount. So that, uh, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, my name is Lynn Tanoe. I'm in the Department of Medicine uh, at Yale School of Medicine and I direct our uh, lung screening and nodule program. I don't have any disclosures. And um, tonight, uh, what I'd like uh, to get across in this talk is that you are aware of the updated USPSTF recommendations for lung cancer screening. Uh, I think it's important to understand the evidence base is demonstrating the mortality benefit because that means that screening is, is successful and lung cancer screening has been a long time to come to this table. Um, and I hope that at the end of uh, the next 20 minutes that you will be motivated to implement lung cancer screening in your clinical practices. So I'm gonna give you a very high level lung cancer uh, background. We'll talk about the USPSTF recommendations for lung cancer screening, which were just updated last year. 
And I'm just gonna talk about three studies that form the uh, fundamental evidence base for lung cancer screening, and then with a little bit about benefits and risks. So um, in the United States, uh, cancer is the leading cause of, um, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women. Uh, in 2022, it's estimated that about 118,000 men and 119,000 women uh, will be diagnosed with lung cancer. And this is the first year that this unfortunate um, imbalance exists that women now get lung cancer more frequently than men. Um, lung cancer will cause an estimated 69,000 deaths in men and 61,000 deaths in women. That's 130,000 people dying of lung cancer this year. Uh, these are data from the American Cancer Society going back to 1930 when these data first started being kept. Uh, lung cancer deaths in men on the top are in this red line and on women in the bottom, again, in the red line. And you can see that lung cancer causes more deaths than all these other more co most common tumors. It actually causes more deaths than breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer combined. Uh, it is the second most common uh, cancer in men and women. Um, again, first uh, leading cause of uh, cancer death. And really the problem we face with lung cancer is that the five-year survival is so low. And so in um, last year, the five-year survival for lung cancer was 22%. That's actually a lot better than it was even 10 years ago, which reflects advances uh, in research and therapies. But you can see that that five-year survival really pales into comparison with what we have achieved for colorectal breast. And prostate cancer is the three next most common uh, cancers where five-year survival has improved um, tremendously. And for many of these cancers, we're talking about 10 and, and 20 years survival. And that is really what we need to achieve uh, with lung cancer, but it's a big mountain to climb. And the reason five-year survival is so poor in lung cancer is that we diagnose cancers late. And so if we look at this pie chart for lung cancer, nearly half are diagnosed at stage four or when disease is already um, metastatic and only 23% at stage one, the earliest stage that we can uh, find that cancer and when cure uh, is possible. And when you look at five-year survival for the stages one, two, three, four, you can see how steeply that falls off. We certainly need to do better with stage one, but when you have a 4% uh, four five-year survival for stage four and half of the patients are being diagnosed at that stage, you can see then why our five-year survival rate overall is so low. And the, uh, in, in contrast, breast cancer really demonstrates the opposite, where half of Patients with breast cancer are diagnosed at stage one and only 6% at stage four. And when you look then at five-year survival for each stage, you can see why the breast cancer survival over five years is so high because most patients are really being diagnosed here. And so we really need to do early detection for lung cancer. And for the past eight or nine years, we have had uh, that ability, but we've been underusing it. So in on the very last day of 2013, uh, USPSTF made this landmark recommendation for annual screening for lung cancer with low-dose CT in adults ages age 50 to 80 years who have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. And that was the first time that USPSTF recommended any lung cancer screening uh, in the United States. Um, decades has been spent looking at chest x-ray as an intervention for lung cancer screening. And the bottom line was all the trials were negative, culminating really in the publication from the prostate, lung, colon, ovarian, PLCO screening trial, looking at their 155,000 um, participants who'd been followed for multiple years. Uh, they looked at chest x-ray versus no screening, which was actually standard of care. Um, and it really doesn't matter whether you had a chest x-ray or no chest x-ray because the curves for cumulative deaths superimpose. And so chest x-ray is not an effective screening tool because it does not increase, um, it does not decrease mortality with a decrease in mortality being the gold standard for successful screening. Um, the US PSTF change in recommendation, um, December 31st, 2000. 
2013 really was based predominantly on the National Lung Screening Trial, which is the first of the three studies I would like you to see. Um, NLST enrolled 53,000 participants and followed them for six years. High risk for lung cancer for this study was, ident was ident identified as ages 55 to 74, greater than or equal to 30 pack years of smoking and currently smoking or quit within 15 years. And if that sounds familiar because I just said it for USPSTF, it's because it's based on this. Um, patients were randomized to either annual screening with low dose CT or chest X-ray. There were a total of three screens done over the span of three years, once a year. And the study was powered uh, so that it could identify a 20% reduction in uh, mortality from lung cancer, which was felt to be kind of a threshold for successful screening. This study cost $250 million uh, to do and, and really involved so many patients because that was the power that was required to achieve potentially that mortality reduction. And the data are here on the right. And what you can see is that um, in terms of the number of lung cancers identified, low dose CT identified more than chest radiography, and that was significant. But more importantly, more, um, people who were enrolled in the intervention low dose CT arm had fewer lung cancer deaths. The study was actually stopped early because it was uh, clear that this endpoint was going to be achieved. So what the actual uh, mort mortality reduction could have been, we're never going to know because it was stopped when the 20% became inevitable to be um, achieved. The other important piece of information is that most of the cancers diagnosed in NLST were early stage, 63% were uh, stage one. And so the screening in this case achieved what the intent was, which, which was to diagnose cancers early uh, when they could be cured and to decrease mortality. And this study had probably the shortest conclusion I've ever seen for a New England Journal of Medicine paper. Screening with low dose CT reduces mortality from lung cancer. Uh, this study was followed by a study uh, in Europe called the Nelson study. This was done in the Netherlands and in Belgium. It was a smaller study, but also a double blind randomized controlled trial. Um, they had 16,000 participants, most of whom were men. They were ages 50 to 75, so included a, a slightly younger population and less cigarette exposure, greater than 15 uh, cigarettes per day for 25 years or 10 cigarettes a day for more than 30 years. They were though heavy smokers and the median smoking um, history was 38 pack years. They had to have been more proximately smoking, currently smoking or quit within 10 years. And the Nelson study had the advantage over NLST of measuring the positive findings, which are lung nodules by volume as opposed to linear diameter. And so they could actually um, calculate doubling time, which is a much more sensitive measure of growth uh, than, a, than linear diameter. We do have actually the capability in our CT scanners to do this, but it is very um, time intensive for the radiologist. This is probably the next iteration of screening uh, down the road in the United States to incorporate nodule, nodule volume measurement. But for the time being, your abnormal results will be reported back to you as uh, linear diameters of nodules. Uh, these patients were um, randomized to low dose CT screening or nothing. Uh, they did not do a chest X-ray arm. There were four uh, low-dose CTs done over the span of six years, and the patients were followed uh, for 10 years. So their duration between screens was longer than NLST. Uh, the study was also positive, not stopped early, and the data are here. And although the curves look different than NLST, what you can see is that there were more cancers diagnosed in the group that was screened with low-dose CT than in the control group that didn't get any screening. And there were fewer cancer deaths in the screening group compared to the control. So the uh, cumulative rate ratio for death from lung cancer was 0.76, and that was statistically significant. So they actually had a 24% reduction in lung cancer mortality. And there was a signal that this was actually uh, stronger in women with a 34%, um, I'm sorry, this is 24%, 34%. A reduction in mortality, but there weren't enough women in this study, unfortunately, to reach significant significance, although this was a very um, interesting finding. 
Nelson also demonstrated again that there is a shift towards earlier stage when you screen. And so the uh, Nelson intervention group with low dose CT is shown here in the blue bars. And you can see that more than 50% of patients were diagnosed with cancer at early stage, stage 1A and B. This is solitary nodule less than uh, three centimeters whereas only about 11% were uh, diagnosed with stage four. And if you remember the pie chart, this is a dramatic change uh, from that distribution. And what's really striking is that the bars in red and green are the control arm in green and their cancer registry, which is essentially another sort of control group. And you can see that half of patients are diagnosed at stage four, which is again what that pie chart shows. So when you look at the blue bars compared to the red and green bars, you really see this move with screening towards detecting cancer at much earlier stage. And the last study is the Southern Community Cohort Study. Uh, there are clearly many, many studies looking at screening, but this particular one was important because it really addressed health disparities um, in lung cancer and lung cancer screening. So uh, Dr. Aldrich, who's from Vanderbilt, did a prospective study of lung cancer screening in 12 southern states um, in, the, in 2002 to 2009. Um, they looked at everybody in um, a lot of uh, community clinics, predominantly community and not academic medical center clinics. And they uh, looked at 48,000 African-American and white current and former smokers aged 40 to 79. Two thirds of the population was African American and uh, one third was white. And what they saw, what they saw was that 17% uh, of African American smokers were eligible for screening, compared to 31% of uh, white smokers. And so there's this big discrepancy in who would be eligible uh, for screening that was associated uh, with race. They then looked at all of the cancers that occurred in this population over that time frame, and they came up with uh, about 1,300 new lung cancers. And when they looked at those patients, what they found was that 32% of the African-American patients who had gotten lung cancer were eligible for lung cancer screening based on the USPSTF criteria compared to 56% of whites. So many more uh, whites were eligible for lung cancer screening uh, than blacks. And really the lack of eligibility was primarily associated with lesser smoking among African-Americans who got lung cancer with a median pack years of 26 compared to 48 uh, in, in the white smoking patients who had gotten lung cancer. And this really, again, brought out this observation that African-Americans and women seem to get lung cancer at a lower smoking intensity exposure and also at younger age. So that Aldrich's group uh, recommended that the smoking pack year eligibility criteria for USPSTF screening be decreased to 20 pack years to try to address this health disparity where fewer African Americans were being screened because they weren't eligible on the basis of the smoking intensity. And if that were uh, to be implemented, that it would increase the percentage of Afri African American smokers who would be eligible uh, for screening. And they did this very interesting uh, sensitivity study. And I'm not going to go through everything on this graph. But what they looked at was in the population with the existing USPSTF guidelines, what is the sensitivity of screening to pick up a lung cancer? And uh, African-American uh, sensitivity is shown here in the solid orange line and whites in the dotted orange line. And you can see that the sensitivity of screening was much, much lower. And so the question is, well, how can you um, bring that sensitivity more equitably to so the curves look more similarly? And they modeled out what would happen if, you, if we had screened at 20 pack years as the threshold. And you can see that the, um, the solid orange line and the dotted orange line still don't quite meet, but they become much closer and there is no decrease in sensitivity in whites by uh, making that change. And so on the basis of that, and actually many other uh, cancer screening studies, um, last March, so a year ago, USPSDF updated its recommendation for lung cancer screening to include adults now ages 50 to 80 years, so a younger population with a 20-pack year smoking history along the lines of the recommendation of 
of the group from Vanderbilt who are currently smoking or quit within the past 15 years. And this um, expansion of the USPSTF criteria now makes about 14 million Americans eligible for lung cancer screening. So um, uh, both speakers so far have mentioned shared decision-making, and I think we incorporate that into all of our daily practices. Lung cancer screening does differ from um, other screening for cancers because it's actually mandatory uh, that you do it to be uh, for the test to be reimbursed by Medicare so that there must be documentation that a shared decision uh, making session with the patient was actually was actually occurred. Um, the updated uh, guidelines now do not make it necessary for that shared decision making to occur with a physician or APRN, a trained individual, including a, a our end or some other healthcare um, providing person can now do that shared decision making uh, visit. And it is very important because, like all other cancer screenings, there are known benefits and potential harms um, that were very clear in all of um, these studies. This is a, a CT scan that actually includes imaging of every part of the chest and upper abdomen. And that makes it different than other cancer screenings where it's really only the organ of interest that appears on uh, whatever study is being done. Uh, there are a lot of false positives. The false positive rate in NLST was actually 94%. So most of the nodules that are identified by screening are not going to be cancers. And so it is very important that the um, American College of Radiology lung rats uh, algorithm for nodule evaluation is used because the intent of that is to minimize unnecessary evaluation of nodules that are not likely to harm. And it does provide this opportunity to talk to the patient about tobacco cessation. And many people feel this is the teachable moment that when a patient is motivated to listen to you as the expert about lung cancer screening, that that may be the time when your three minutes of smoking cessation counseling is most effective. So uh, there are also lung cancer risk assessment models for patients who smoked or actually didn't smoke. Lung cancer screening, though, is only offered by um, Medicare uh, to patients with that pretty intensive smoking history. This is the prostate, lung, colon, ovarian model that was developed in 2012 based on the PLCO population. Uh, this is the website where you can get it really easily by Googling PLCO M2012 Brock University. The primary author for this model is at Brock University in Canada. And I think what this um, demonstrates is that there are a lot of risk factors for lung cancer besides smoking, although smoking is a causative agent in probably 85 to 90% of, of all comers with lung cancer, or at least a contributor. But many other factors uh, create risk. Um, body mass index, whether you have uh, other lung disease, if you have had an uh, other cancer yourself or that there's a family history of cancer. And there's definitely influence uh, based on race and ethnicity, as well as smoking intensity. And the nice thing about this calculator is it does give you a probability of lung cancer uh, in the next six years. And so for this 73-year-old patient who has these demographics, that lung cancer risk is about 5%. And that actually turns out to be double the risk of NLST or Nelson. And so this patient would be considered very high risk, even though that number may not look so high. Um, so it's important to ground that in who was the high risk population for uh, those studies and what did that mean? So the benefits of lung cancer uh, screening, I think are pretty obvious, decreased lung cancer mortality, detection of lung cancer early stage, detection of disease when it's treatable, improvement in survival and quality of life, and providing that teachable moment for uh, tobacco cessation. But there are also risks predominantly related to the high false positive um, likelihood of finding uh, nodules that are not destined to harm. And those nodules can create unnecessary testing and procedures and economic, emotional, and physical costs, which hopefully can be minimized if we stick to the algorithmized reading of lung reds given to us by ACR. There can be false negative results. We used to worry a lot more about the detection of indolent disease that would really not render any benefit, and that is known as overdiagnosis. There is some radiation exposure related to having a test with radiation every year, 
but it really takes thousands and tens of thousands of examinations to generate enough harm that one person would get lung cancer or another cancer from their screening. And then I've already mentioned that this is a, a CT scan of more than one organ, and so incidental findings are quite frequent. Speaking with patients in these, in these shared decision-making visits makes it uh, clear what that there are actually individual patient level barriers for lung cancer screening related to stigma, uh, fear of a test, and in particular, this is often confused with a closed MRI and you can alleviate that. Patients are afraid of getting a cancer diagnosis so may avoid having uh, the screen. They're afraid of having surgery or radiation or more uh, you know, medical therapy. Um, my uh, screening APRN recently had a patient tell her, I can't afford to have lung cancer. I'm not sure I want this screen. Access and cost. And I think we all of these are common perhaps to all screening uh, interventions, but particularly to lung. And then I, I just want to encourage everybody on this call to think about lung cancer screening and talk to their patients because it is a relatively new uh, screening program. Um, we should have had this long ago uh, because lung cancer kills so many patients uh, every year. These are, these are statistics across the states in the United States in 2020, and this is Connecticut. And you can see that in 2020 in Connecticut, 7% of eligible patients underwent lung cancer screening, which is really low. We really need to increase that number. If we wanna to get to that, we can save 20 out of 100 lives from cancer. And what's really ironic on this slide is the state of Kentucky, which has the highest smoking prevalence in the country and the highest lung cancer incidence, actually is screening twice as many patients percentage-wise as we are doing in Connecticut. And the reason that this has actually really taken off in Kentucky is because of community and state-based efforts to really get the word out. And so um, there have been uh, laws passed in the legislature to support lung cancer screening um, and a lot of community advocacy groups that have taken uh, this on. And so the take home points for tonight from this section is that remember lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women in this country. In the world, it is the leading cause of cancer death, 1.6 million deaths uh, last year. Detection of disease at early stage improves survival and increases the chance of cure. There's a very strong evidence base demonstrating that screening for lung cancer with low dose CT decreases lung cancer mortality, so this will save lives. The 2021 updated recommendations expands the populations of all people, but particularly it's uh, geared towards uh, resolving the health disparities that we see for African Americans and women who are now increasingly eligible for screening. And 14 million people are eligible in this country, but right now we're screening only 5 to 10 percent. And so just to remind you, please screen your patients who meet the eligibility criteria, 50 to 80 years old, who have a 20-pack year smoking history, and currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Tinu, for this wonderful review. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll start getting more and more uh, uh, patients referred for lung cancer screening as important as you've shown. Very good. And uh, we're going to move on now to the uh, last presentation, and that's on a colorectal cancer screening. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So we're going to review colorectal cancer um, incidence trends. Um, to the, tonight, uh, we are gonna be uh, looking at screening modalities and also we'll review the newest guidelines on starting screening at an earlier age that most of you are familiar with already. So um, colorectal cancer is still the third leading cancer in both men and women, and also the third leading uh, um, uh, cancer-related uh, deaths, both in men and women. But the good news really on colorectal cancer is what I'm showing here, which is this very nice steady decrease in both incidence and mortality uh, since the mid-1980s, beginning 1990s uh, of colorectal cancer, again, incidence and mortality. And a lot of it has uh, to do with exactly 
what I'm showing here, which is this uh, steady increase also in the utilization of colonoscopy. As we've been doing more colonoscopies, um, uh, we've seen that decrease in the incidence rate. Other factors have played also a role in that uh, decrease in uh, colorectal cancer, but certainly screening has played a very, very important role. Over the last few years, we've been hearing more and more about uh, um, not starting with uh, uh, colonoscopy as a screening uh, as the first screening option, but also other types of screening uh, tests that uh, uh, recent uh, um, studies have shown their, um, their uh, usefulness for colorectal cancer screening. Uh, so those include CT colonography, but it also includes um, uh, stool-based studies uh, that basically uh, test for alterations, either blood, a cold blood in the stool or some a cold blood plus um, uh, DNA uh, abnormalities related to uh, uh, malignant cells that at the end of the day um, uh, would result in a positive test that would require a, a follow-up colonoscopy. But the um, issue about this test is that really, um, uh, and that was very rec uh, uh, recognized in uh, 19, uh, 2016 by USPSTF, is that we really don't have a lot of data that compares head to head those different screening methods. We have very good um, uh, studies showing efficacy of all the methods that I showed to you uh, and the legit legitimacy of using these methods, but not much comparison between the, the two different ones. And, and they also stated that although single test performance is an important issue in the detection of colorectal cancer, the sensitivity of the test over time is more important, how uh, the tests perform over time. So uh, with that in mind, uh, they try, uh, USPSTF, uh, what they did is they commissioned uh, what they call the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network, CISNET, and that included three different um, um, analytical models uh, performed in different institutions to inform really recommendations uh, for uh, colorectal cancer screening. These are the three different groups. And what they did is they used the, uh, they based the modeling on historical colorectal cancer incidence data from the pre-screening area. So from 1975 to 1979, where really we could not see the effects of screening because uh, colorectal cancer screening had not been um, uh, implemented at that time. So, um, and the analysis would have to um, uh, include um, benefits, harms, and burden of colorectal cancer screening. That's what they really looked at. So this is some of the data uh, that came out of that modeling uh, commissioned by uh, USPSTF. Uh, for, uh, here on the left side, you see all the different modalities of colorectal cancer screening. Uh, there's an added one, which is the multi-target stool DNA every year, which is not the recommended one. The recommended one is every three years. The other ones are uh, standard of care recommendations, but they looked that one too in that specific time frame. And um, there are several things that they assess. In this one, I'm showing life years gain per thousand individual screen. And what they saw is I'm showing here the, uh, the uh, middle of the uh, different, um, of the different uh, uh, brackets when it comes to uh, the estimates according to the three models. So the uh, life years uh, gain per thousand colonoscopies actually using colonoscopies, the primary method would be 270. Uh, and the one with the lowest performance would be a flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years with 221. At the end of the day, though, all the, um, all the uh, uh, different uh, screening modalities were, within, uh, uh, were yielding within the 18% range of the highest performer, which would be colonoscopy here. So pretty good performance uh, in, uh, as assessed per uh, for, uh, life years gain per thousand uh, screen individuals. And this is another one that's colorectal cancer deaths averted per thousand screen. And um, they got 24 in the modeling for colonoscopy every 10 years versus the lowest performers, which were flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years and the multi-target stool DNA every uh, three years. But at the end of the day, again, a difference of one to four, depending on which modeling you would uh, use. Uh, one to four deaths of difference among the different screening options per thousand uh, screened uh, individuals. And they look also for complications. And uh, uh, here, obviously, the more uh, ag aggressive test for screening is obviously colonoscopy, and that had the highest uh, uh, number of um, uh, predicted uh, complications 
with the lowest number being uh, nine for uh, the multi-targets to uh, DNA uh, test. So a difference uh, overall from four to six complication difference among the different screening options per hundred per thousand uh, screen individuals. Finally, they look at the burden of this um, and the burden here in this case, looking at how many colonoscopies it does require per thousand individual screen. So uh, um, when they looked at colonoscopies needed, when you are using colonoscopy every five, every 10 years as your screening method of choice, that would be uh, about four colonoscopies in a lifetime per individual. But uh, uh, if we look at the lowest, uh, the one that required less colonoscopy, that would be uh, when screening for uh, with uh, uh, feet uh, test every year, that would be close to 2,000 colonoscopies per 1,000 individual screens. So that would mean that basically that would cut in half the number of colonoscopies needed uh, uh, per patient from four colonoscopies to two colonoscopies. So that uh, still a significant burden even using the uh, these other uh, pre-screening tests, if uh, if we choose to do so, but certainly uh, it would definitely decrease the uh, overall burden of uh, for colonoscopy. So non-colonoscopy strategies pretty much result in about half of the total colonoscopies performed. So based on all that, the uh, the USPS TF really departed from the. Uh, prior iterations where really there was there were sets of preferred tests and in this case it was colonoscopy the preferred test to uh, no longer emphasizing that and really emphasizing that the clinical decision should involve all the considerations that we're talking about um, and uh, not only evidence alone and more options then that's uh, there are a good number of studies that shown that more options can result in better screening uptake uh, some individuals may be more amenable to some uh, of the options than others. And in some other cases, availability of uh, some tests, particularly colonoscopy, may not be as uh, available. And therefore, um, um, the uh, stool-based test, for instance, or CT colonography could be more uh, attractive um, uh, choices. So individualized decision-making to the specific patient or situation, as well as local availability of testing options was really um, uh, emphasized. So I think that goes uh, also to uh, Dr. Tanu's comment about the uh, uh, shared decision-making where more and more uh, with all the options that we have and none of them really being right and wrong, but uh, really um, uh, making sure that uh, everything uh, or every, uh, we, uh, we, we look at all the different possibilities that can actually fit our individual patient, uh, um, that's probably the what's going to give us the best chance for a high uptake of uh, screening. And this is an important message that came out from those uh, uh, guidelines in 2016. They, they stated the screening is a cascade of activities that must occur in concert, cohesively, and in an organized way for benefits to be realized from the point of the initial screening examination, including related interventions or services that are required for successful administration of the screening test, such as a bowel preparation, for instance, or sedation with endoscopy, to the timely receipt of any necessary diagnostic follow-up and treatment. So really, we have to put it in this larger context. Um, uh, we can screen with colonoscopies, but if patients are not well prepped, uh, we are going to fail in, in really detecting uh, lesions. So uh, there's just, uh, um, and if we're using uh, stool-based tests, if we don't have a proper way to really follow up and make sure that they happen in the uh, either uh, yearly or every three years for the multi-target uh, stool DNA test, we are not going to be able to succeed. So whatever we do, it should be in an organized fashion to really uh, um, maximize the benefit from it. So uh, with all these, where we stand with uh, colorectal cancer screening in the US, after all these years, screening rates have uh, increased, this have slowed over the last few years, and we're still close to a third of uh, eligible individuals who are not up to date uh, with screening. And uh, individual groups that are uh, less than 50% up to date with screening would be individuals in the 50 to 54 years uh, of age range. Hispanics, people with less than high school diploma, or individuals with Medicaid or uninsured. So there's uh, uh, these groups of individuals where really screening is uh, uh, dismal, it still has dismal numbers. 
among all the non-up-to-date group, over a third are uh, individuals age 50 to 54. So even though for many years we've been recommending to start screening at age 50, uh, we still uh, underperform dramatically in that uh, age. And there are a lot of reasons. Some of them is that uh, lack time that I'm uh, stating here where it, um, for screening to really finally happen, we do need to talk to patients for a while before they become convinced. But also they are, the other reason is the more as, as the population is uh, um, younger, they have uh, less medical illnesses, they have less contact with the medical system, um, there are less opportunities for us to really talk to them about colorectal cancer screening. But also half uh, uh, of the individual, even though we said that Medicaid and uninsured have the lowest screening rates, half of the uh, 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 individuals with private insurance and a quarter of Medicare patients do uh, are not up to date with uh, screening. So certainly there's a lot of room, but anyways, we are much more effective screening the captive audience as we were talking about individuals. We have um, um, uh, uh, contacts on a regular basis with our healthcare system. We really need to figure out a way to really reach out to those, those individuals who do, are not regularly seen by medical providers and who happen to be in this younger age. And I'll show you in a minute why that is so important. So with all this, um, and, and, and um, one uh, of the facts that we really recognize over the last few years is that uh, in spite of this wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, data over the last uh, 30 years or so on the uh, steady decrease in incidence of colorectal cancer in uh, older than 50, we've seen this uh, uh, very steady increase in the incidence of the younger individuals in between 20 and 49. That's translated in a, an increase, an annual increase of 1.8% from 2006 to 2015 in the individuals that are younger than 55. Really pretty significant uh, increase, particularly so when comparing with the overall um, numbers. And uh, so among adults younger than 55, there's been a 51 uh, in percent increase in incidence of colorectal cancer from 94 to 2014, and an 11% increase in mortality from 2005 to 2015. And if you look at here in this graph, here we have a year's, year of birth. And if you look closely, basically almost uh, uh, all uh, individuals uh, who were born after age uh, after uh, 1960, in all age groups, we see an uptick in colorectal cancer uh, incidence. So anyone basically who has been born after that, uh, uh, after 1960, we've seen that increase in colorectal cancer incidence. And the increase in the annual percentage change in the incidence rate for adults age 40 to 49, which, is a bit, which has been on average 1.3%, has been more than twice that of the adults age 50 to 54. So really dramatic increase in the uh, uh, younger uh, side of the um, of these patients. This suggests that the risk for the younger cohort will continue to carry forward into the group age 50 to 54 over the next few years. Therefore, the uh, the uh, effect will be really important. And, and what I'm really showing here is that truly what we call the uh, age 45 is the new 50. And, and that clearly has been uh, shown here, where basically uh, what we've seen is that the uh, incidence of, at, uh, uh, of the uh, colorectal cancer at age 45 in 2015 has reached the same uh, incidence that we had at age 50 in 1993, which is about 30 uh, per 100,000 individuals. And that's why we say 45 is the new 50 in colorectal cancer, because that's where we, that's where we are right now. Um, and uh, that's how back in a way we've moved uh, from that standpoint, unfortunately. So adults born around 1990 have twice the risk of colorectal cancer and four times the risk of rectal cancer compared to adults born around 1950. So, uh, and, uh, so we can see that while in 1990, 6.4% of colorectal cancers were among individuals younger than 50, that in 2015 had doubled to 12.4%. So really significant increase. And I think that really, um, this slide really shows a lot, which is even though the uh, numbers are much lower in this younger population, when you look at live years, uh, life, uh, years lost due to this disease, 
uh, in the group of 45 to 49, that's about 10% of all live years lost due to this disease. And that compares to 13% for the 50 to 54. And this is really a strong, um, a strong argument uh, to make a about uh, decreasing screening uh, age to 45. So the, uh, uh, with all this data, the ACS in 2018 uh, decided to reevaluate the optimal age to start screening for average risk population. And basically what they did is, uh, okay, well, uh, uh, they look at uh, the uh, commission, one of these modeling uh, um, groups that actually uh, USPSTF has been using. And what they did is they analyzed outcomes uh, uh, not only uh, under that assumption that that the, the uh, of the pre-screening years, but also they what they did is they incorporated the the recent SEER data incidence data showing that increase in the onset colorectal cancer. And in that case, what they showed is that here we have the different met methods: colonoscopy, CT colonography, flexic fit, and other tool tests. Uh, starting either at 45 versus 50, what they saw is that moving to 45 starting screening rates, we would increase 6.2% uh, live years again with the cost of about 17% 17 more colonoscopies. So they did conclude that modeling convincingly demonstrated that due to the rising incidence of colorectal cancer in younger individuals, screening all average risk persons between the ages of 45 and 75 reduces mortality from colorectal cancer with an acceptable uh, risk as measured by number of colonoscopies per life years gained. So the trend of increasing colorectal cancer incidence in, su in success uh, successively younger birth cohorts suggest that this recommendation will really continue to be appropriate in the future and the benefit burden balance strongly favors changing to 45. After that, the USPSTF, and that was published last year, commissioned the same modeling groups again, and they did the same process that they did before in 2016, uh, uh, comparing age 50 versus um, age starting at age 45. And here we, uh, they look at uh, additional life years gain and basically what they saw is that starting at 45 to 75, they would, uh, uh, we would increase about from 22 to 27, the number of additional live years gained per hundred per thousand individual screen. Here they looked at additional colorectal cancers averted and starting at, four, at 45 would uh, uh, result in three more additional colorectal cancers averted uh, out of a thousand individual screen. With, again, with 17% uh, more colonoscopies. So all these data, USPSTF came up with the same recommendation with the, that the ACS came up with in 2018, um, which was uh, starting screening uh, for average, average risk individuals at 45 instead of, of um, age 50, as it had been so far. So for the USPSTF, uh, in summary, screening average risk asymptomatic adults age 50 to 75 is of substantial benefit and modeling suggests the benefits will also be substantial for age 45. The benefits of early detection and intervention for colorectal cancer screening seem to decline after age 75 and decision to screen individuals from 76 to 85 should really be an individual one considering overall health prior screening history and benefiting after age 85 seems to be a very, uh, a very unlikely benefit uh, given the potential for adverse events. So uh, um, with all these, uh, uh, a group of us have tried to really uh, um, incorporate all that type of information um, uh, in a way that uh, uh, the providers in our system would have all the tools to really work on that decision-making process shared with the patients and trying to really find the appropriate way to screen individuals. And that came out, uh, uh, came live in the EPIC system-wide at Yale New Human Health uh, just yesterday. And that's the colorectal can cancer screening pathway where we really um, um, go through the different um, um, recommendations when it comes for uh, when we should, we should not screen. But then after that, it gives you um, the, uh, um, uh, takes you into evaluating if the individual is high risk versus um, uh, average risk. Here we have uh, some examples where basically as you hover in uh, all these uh, blue um, text, you'll see, for instance, this is uh, hovering over stool-based testing, will give you benefits and risk, for instance, or actually you can have here opening up a, a table of sensitivity specificity of all the different uh, um, screening tests for both uh, polyps and uh, cancer. And it takes you down here, helps you also analyze who is at 
uh, high risk and therefore we would be suggesting colonoscopy versus uh, uh, non-colonoscopy approaches. And basically at the end of the day, once you uh, uh, make that decision, it also allows you to really place the orders directly for colonoscopy, for CT colonography, and for a stool-based test. So uh, it, uh, within the same path, we were able to really uh, go through the whole process. So we hope that this tool will be really helpful, not only to increase screening grades, but also to help the providers to have those discussions with the right information uh, and, and making sure that the, every patient uh, does have uh, uh, the benefit of really being able to uh, 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 make a, a, a well-informed decision about sc screening approaches. And um, that is all I wanted to uh, talk to you about tonight. And um, I think we'll run out of time. Um, so uh, um, we may not have time for uh, answers, uh, but uh, uh, anyone can feel free to email us and we'll be very happy to, uh, to address any questions uh, from this session. Unfortunately, yeah, time will run out, but again, reach out to us directly, be very happy. And again, thanking uh, uh, tremendously doctors, uh, um, um, there is uh, Tanui and uh, Lasberg uh, for uh, being here, sharing their uh, knowledge and in such wonderful uh, presentations. It's been a pleasure to, to share that time with them. Thank you all for being here tonight. Good night. <laughs>